Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the lecture series in bioelectricity. So, in the previous lecture we talked about hearing and the previous to that we talked about vision. So, among the special senses uh, in the beginning we decided we will be talking about vision, hearing, olfaction, taste and some of the skin related proprioceptors and everything. So, we have covered the stretch reflex arc where we talked about you know the pressure which is there through muscle spindle. Then we talked about vision where we talked about the rods and the cones. Then we talked about the hair cells in responsible in hearing as well as in equilibrium. So, this class we will be discussing about the olfaction or the smell from olfaction all the way to the gustation which is basically the taste. So, to start off with have you ever wondered why the mosquitoes kind of home around you in the night or uh, some of the insect get attracted towards human being. What it is, is it they have a fantastic vision they understand that this is human being. So, we should get good amount of blood from them we will rush towards them. So, if you look for all the vector bone diseases like in mosquito ticks and the relevant diseases like malaria and uh, sleeping sickness like with using sexy flies and all how they get attracted towards human being. So, one possibility could be the warmth of the body the IR radiation they have a sensor they could sense it is a warm body and they move towards it. Of course, this is one of the mode by which they identify there are other modes. Some of the other modes includes they have a extraordinarily well um, developed olfactory system, which is not that well developed in case of man, because we rely a lot on our vision instead of our smelling abilities. Whereas, if you see a dog a snipe dog it can smell lot of things which a human being with its very limited uh, repertoire of uh, olfactory receptors unable to do. Whereas, in the case of insects they are even much better they could you know they could distinctly smell the, um, the smell of your sweat or the body odor they could distinctly smell the octinol, nonanol these kind of compounds which are found in your sweat or they have very extraordinary carbon dioxide receptor. So, if you look at these insects they get attracted towards you by the plethora of receptors in their antennae by virtue of which they could detect the smell and not only that they could detect the smell it is very interesting the odor plume say for example, there is a kind of odor coming out emanating from my body. So, it forms a plume all those volatiles which are there which are forming a plume and these insects say for example, insect is here it could follow the plume either it will like or dislike it. Say for example, one of the chemicals called DEET D -E -T. this is an mosquito repellent. So, whenever it the mosquitoes experiences a plume of DEET they repel and they run away from that or they fly away from that source of that smell or some kind of mosquito repellents or some kind of ointment what we put on the skin. So, this all these things are being uh, processed by a well developed olfactory system. So, here what we will do I will just give a overall outline of it and we will discuss about uh, just the same way we have discussed about uh, vision and uh, we have discussed about uh, hearing we will be discussing olfaction and uh, then I will give you some very specific example from the insect world telling how uh, these studies are being conducted and what are their ramification how these studies are helping the economic entomology where especially with the tropical insects or tropical diseases especially the vector bone diseases where it comes so handy and few other references 
which I wish you people should go through in order to enrich your um, database of uh, or opening up your window to see how these different electrical signals are being exploited uh, in order to develop different kind of modalities to counter different vector borne uh, pathogen. Okay. So, let us start uh, the lecture number 21. number 21. So, one second let me say that ok. So, here we will be dealing with olfaction and gustation. Gustation is taste and olfaction is your smell within olfaction we will be dealing with uh, the world of insects and this whole area falls under a uh, domain of chemical ecology or it is also called sensory ecology. and in case of human being, human being, which as I have mentioned has a fairly low olfactory ability as compared to the insect world and here we will be talking about some of the vector borne diseases. Okay. Now, Coming to the basic architecture, again we will go by the basic architecture first. If you look at the basic architecture, so say for example, this is for the olfaction, your major is the nose. So, what essentially happens, you have these uh, volatiles which there are, one second, let me just. Uh, So, these are the volatile molecules all over the place, different kind of volatile molecules in red as well as orange, blue, green. Okay. So, these are the volatile molecule which are experienced by our nose and we detect a certain smell. So, from the nose, this there are specific cells olfactory neurons. First of all olfactory, olfactory cells you can call them the one which receives the signal and then through olfactory neurons. They are all neurons though, the, these are the first line, it all the way, way, way goes to the through spinal cord, it goes to the brain and decodes the message. And this is what makes you feel that say it could be acetone, alcohol, CO2, nonanol, beta iric acid, likewise. So, so many different smell. Okay a plethora of different smell. In the case of human being, if you see human being at the time of their birth could detect approximately 10,000 different smells and it has been observed with age this ability to detect smell after 50 years with the onset of the aging, the ability to detect the smell takes a down down downward downhill way. As you grow old, your detection limits kind of goes on decreasing. Okay. Now, coming back to the basic architecture, how it looks like. So, at the level of nose, if we kind of you know magnify this further out here, something like this. It looks like ok. 
okay. So, these are these are the very specialized neurons which could which are the kind of <coughs> the olfactory receptor cells these are called. olfactory receptor cells. Then you have the olfactory gland, which is sitting out there in between, which is more like a structure like this. This is the olfactory gland and this could be divided in two parts actually essentially this part is called olfactory epithelium epithelium and out here the second level is called lamina propria Here is the olfactory bulb. So, from here there are series of neurons which takes the message for further coding. And out here, this is the zone where the different olfactory molecules or the volatiles kind of binds. in the yellow and the pink color what I am putting the dots out here. So, these are the different olfactory molecules. So, essentially what happens is this these molecules goes and bind on these surfaces like this. Once they bind they open up the sodium channels and there is a flux of sodium and this flux of sodium leads to change in the electrical signal and this electrical signal eventually travels all the way and through the synaptic connection is transmitted here and this is the way it goes. So, it is very simple circuit, but each one of these cell types has the ability to distinguish or detect one specific kind of order to the maximum ability. That does not mean that it cannot detect another order, but generally the way it looks like is that each type has the ability really combinatorially they have the ability say for example, if I have three kinds of volatiles say A, B and C and D or four kinds. So, this will be A type, this will be B type like there will be C type or a D type. So, there could be 10,000 different types, or there could be 20,000 different types okay. and what essentially that means is that A has the maximum ability to bind to if these violet ones are the A molecules if I assume their maximum binding will be of the violets, maximum receptor will be of the violet as compared to say the pink one which may be you know B type. Okay. So, this is how these uh, specialized neurons have evolved and this architecture. So, this is how here what you see actually essentially is the nose. So, this is if I had to draw a nose it will be almost like this. So, this is underneath nose that is where the volatiles enters and this is the circuit to follow and these are the ones which are sent to brain and in the brain there are specific cortical areas where the processing starts and then based on that we decode the message. So, essentially what it transla translate out to be is this for every order say for example, a pungent order or something there is a unique electrical stimulus. A electrical stimulus codes for say order A for order B likewise and each one of them likewise it goes on they have a combinatorial mixing of say order some give a quantity say 5 units of this signal, 2 units of this signal, 
3 units of another signal, 4 units of another signal, 7 units of another signal and then there is a combination of this permutation and combination by which we get a unique order for every individual component we smell. So, you understand? So, basically those 10,000 neurons are doing a lot of computation, little bit of a signal type A, little bit of signal B, little bit of signal C and that results in a totally combined into a totally different kind of order. So, whenever we smell something, so it, it's, it smells something like this, something like that, we are unable to really detect very clearly. So, this whole combinatorial geometry is very interesting and how this is being dissected out, this is very interesting. So, from here I will take you to the world of insect, where these all these things are being detected. So, some of the modern um, analytical chemistry tools come fairly handy in deciphering some of these receptors. The way it works, say for example, so this is a simple electrophysiology setup coupled with a gas chromatography setup. So, if you look at an insect, uh, most of the time the insects kind of you know looks like this and uh, you know or if you get a side view of an insect, it is something like you know. Okay. So, their major olfactory sense organ, olfactory organs are here, their antennae. So, now what you can do is say for example, so if you could fix an insect like this with its antennas like this, okay. say for example, some moth you know. I am just showing the face of the moth like this okay. and very close to the moth you put an electrode like this, we should be able to you know record from the moth. Okay. Now, on top of that you have a smell injection setup, it is a GC column with its analyzer sitting out here. So, this is the gas chromatography gas chromato chromatography setup and uh, through this the volatiles which are flowing by are released. So, you have a control release, so you can switch on and off out here. So, you have a switch. And here is the electrode you have, and this electrode is connected to a certain voltage with the ground electrode very close by. Okay. Now, you get in your reading panel, you are seeing, say, for example, I say from here I am releasing three gases, say CO2, um, alcohol, or OH, I am just putting OH, and acetone, and uh, say beta hydric acid B A fine, these are the four volatiles which I am going to release and the sequence of it will be A, B, C, D fine. Now, my hypothesis is this that this particular moth, the antenna of the moth could smell ethanol or OH. So, now I allow the CO 2 eject out and here is the elect electrode sitting touching on the surface. So, if this is so, so, so this is say for example, the G C P saying that, so this is this is scale is showing the upper scale is showing G C, G C M S, you could attach it with a mass spec if you have an unknown thing. Okay. So, this is the G C scale and here is the electrical signal. If it has a C O 2 sensor with suppose this is A then there will be an electrical signal you should be able to see in the lower column. If it does not have, then you would not see anything, it will just go like this. Now, if we hypothesize that it has a 
sensor for B, it has neurons which could sense alcohol. So, when the alcohol will be eluted out out here, so this is for B, then I should be able to see a sharp heavy signal of electrical signal out here it could be both sides, it could be like this also you can draw it, I am just drawing on the upper side just as a convention and nothing else. Okay. Now, say for example, now you are eluting out C, this is the signal for C. So, you should be able to see another electrical signal if at all it has a receptor for C or you may not see anything and it will just go like this you know. Like So, this kind of setup. GCMS coupled with electrophysiology is what is used for these kind of insects and of course, you can further verify it using certain behavioral assays where you have you know you have these kind of spheres if, if it is a walking insect and you have the order plume coming from here okay, and you allow the insect to move on it. So, this is a model of a servosphere. So, if you ensure that there is definitely for alcohol, it has an affinity, what you can do, you can put the insect moving insect, if it is a walking insect of course, otherwise if it is a flying insect, then you have to have a wing tunnel. On a wing tunnel from one side, you have to give the odor plume and you have to see whether the insect fly towards it or not, or it repels towards it. These wing tunnel assays are being done for the mosquitoes. Okay. Uh, once again, a wind tunnel assay for mosquitoes and other flying insects, whereas for the walking insect, you use something called servosphere or this is also called locomotion compensator. Locomotion compensator is a very interesting thing. Say, for example, what happened in locomotion compensator? Say, for example, this is a walking insect. Okay. So for example, now on top of this, you stick certain specific compound, a uh, uh, specific material, which could reflect the light like this. So, a locomotion compensator is something like this. So, for example. So, on top of this, if this insect walks in, suppose the order plume is coming like this and this insect walk towards it or on this side. So, based on the, so on, on top of this is you have to imagine a three dimensional because this is in, from the surface it is coming the order plume on the top there is a, there is a sensor. There is a sensor which will tell if the insect moves in this direction, it will, this sphere will compensate and will come back to its original position. If it moves in this direction, it will compensate and will come back to its original position. So, essentially it will allow the insect to be in the same position facing the plume of, uh, of the volatile and if the insect does not really like it, it will turn back and it will start moving towards you while you are looking at this sphere. So, I will request you guys to really look into the servosphere and uh, locomotion compensated because this is not within the purview of this course. I mean, it is a behavioral assay. If you find really wonderful results in the GCMS column, you can really see the servosphere, but this is something very interesting and for this kind of work, you should refer to these work of some of these people like you know, you should look through the work of Walter Leal in uh, Walter Leal is currently in uh, UC University of California at Davis you should see the work of uh, one individual who is currently a faculty, you should see the work of Syed. He has worked with Walter Leal, currently he is uh, I think University of Nebraska, where you should see follow his work, he has worked in mosquitoes. You should see the work of professor, so both all of them are professors, okay. uh, professor Patrick Guerin in uh, University of Neuchatel, Switzerland. These are the people who, there are many other names which I mean I will just try to you know pull up some of these references. You should look for their work, 
because they have done significant amount of work in last 20 to 30 years in this area where uh, some of these servo spheres have, have been developed and I will give you the original reference which was done by I think Kramer who actually developed during 1976 the servo sphere model where you can really see the you can do the computation. But in the area what I essentially wanted to highlight the reason to you know expose you to these kind of uh, areas is this that the world of electricity, bioelectricity is very wide, very, very wide from the insect world to the human to the plant, it is all well spread out. It is essential that you have to keep your mind open to you know appreciate all these things, because I mean just 40 lectures or 40, 50 lectures is not sufficient really to you know kind of open yourself up to the whole world. End of the day, you have to realize it is a simple computation, whether the modality may change modality may be you know light, modality may be sound, modality may be uh, modality may be uh, smell or olfaction, but end of the day they code an electrical signal through of course, rod and cone or for the sound the hair cell, for a smell olfactory cells likewise, but end of the day they all code certain unique electrical signature and these electrical signatures essentially falls under the whole area of neural code and this is where we say we call an apple an apple because there is an unique neural code for an apple, there is a unique neural code for a grass, there is an unique color coding. So, that is what makes our whole world around us so very interesting. In the same line touching upon this since I have touched upon the olfaction I have take, give, given you a very brief uh, exceptionally brief outline about how these are being used, how, how you could utilize these kind of models where it all goes. Say for example, you know for say set C mosquitoes, if you know exactly what kind of molecules or volatiles they are getting attracted okay. or say for example, you talk about the ticks in the temperate countries this is a huge problem. If you know the volatiles which are attracting them or repelling them both ways you know attract or volatiles which you know let me put a different color code for it or the volatiles which you know repels them. So, you can develop a uh, if you, if you know that it is an attractant, then you can develop a trap, where you can trap them, because they will be coming close to it and if you know it is a repellent, then you could develop an insect repellent. This is a whole area of amazing research, where entomologists along with the electrophysiologists are utilizing or exploiting the electrical properties exhibited by these different insects to devise methodologies against vector bone pathogens. Okay. So, from here I will just uh, take you to the world of taste or gustation, which is again in the case of human being starts declining after the age of 50, but I will just give you a very briefly kind of if you look at your tongue and this again gustation is a very uh, interesting topic in the case of insects, because if you look at it I mean you see a lot of insects along you know cow dung or you know all this kind of you know places or along um, this dustbin and everything you know trash, why is it so? It means they could taste certain material, which we cannot of course you know, but for x y z reasons. So, crustacean is again very highly evolved in several lower animals. In the case of human, if you look at the tongue, the structure of the tongue which is involved in it, it is something like this. So, if this is the structure of the tongue, then you will observe that there are different areas which have different role, like the tip of the tongue, if this is the tongue is involved in sweet smell, whereas there is a area which is now I am putting in a kind of you know hatched area which is kind of involved in sour. Okay. Then similarly, there are 
there is another area which is kind of uh, overlapping which ensures your sorry uh, I just made a mistake actually this is this is the suite and this is this is this is essentially is the salt and this is the sour area and then you have certain areas like you know which ensures for bitterness. So, if you really look at all these things, so from here what essentially this tells you, this list can go on and on, there is no end to this. So, what is essentially says underneath these structures, there are specific cell types. These cells carry the message, based on that there are sodium channels which are opening and they are generating a specific kind of you know electrical signal these are carried all the way to the brain and that is where we decode the message. So, for individual type for the sweetness, for the sour, for the salt, for the bitterness, there are specific kind of cell types, gustatory cell types which are present. They ensure that we kind of you know there is always a combination suppose we have something which is slightly sweet and sour. So, basically when we talk about the less sweet and sour chicken or sweet and sour vegetable, what does that mean? When technically that means that you are tasting something which has a sweet component as well as sour component. So, the electrical impulses are generating from here, electrical impulses are generating from here and the brain is pretty much processing these two together and telling you know it has a sweeter sour taste or something as a sweet and bitter or sour and bitter or salt and bitter. So, basically there is a computation which is taking place out here as well as out here you know and it may be something which has multiple taste. So, end of the day what is the most important key point is they are activating the sodium channels and those sodium channels are leading to electrical signals. So, for sweetness anything which is sweet there is an unique electrical signature and obviously, for the saltness there is another set of electrical signature for salt this is just I am randomly drawing. So, do not think that you know something for bitterness there may be something like this. So, they are all unique electrical signature which are being transmitted at a different phase with a different frequency with a different kind of you know density. And these signals are being deciphered by the brain and based on that we understand what we are smell uh, what we are tasting. So, if you look at this whole uh, if I had to summarize this whole special senses what we have talked about the vision, hearing, olfaction, taste you will see all of them have one common feature they all code if I had to summary this summary of the special senses, summary of special senses are vision, hearing, taste. smell, they are all coding they have one common feature, they all code for they are all translated into electrical signal, they are all involved in sodium channel, potassium channel, chloride channel likewise these all are sent to the brain for further decoding. This is the overall if I had to give one small layman summary this is how it looks like. In the case of vision you have rod slash cones taking care of colors, you have the hair cells, you have 
taste neurons, you have olfactory neurons and then you have touch neurons like so on and so forth, but all of them follows this, they all have an electrical component. All this ionic component, ionic electricity which is eventually sent to the brain and this whole area of coding is the final frontier where mankind is heading is neural code. What is a neural code? In other word, a question could be asked, could we hear a image? In other word, you are seeing something and this is connected instead of in the brain to the visual cortex V C or say from the olfactory cortex O C and for hearing auditory cortex A C. Say for example, a visual connection goes all the way to auditory cortex, what will happen? Or a hearing goes to visual cortex, what will happen? A taste or, um, or gustatory receptor goes to say uh, auditory cortex, what will happen? These are the questions of the future where we are heading, where many of our answers lies about who we are in solving those wonderful questions. So, I am closing on here in the next class, we will be talking about the learning and memory and all the higher functions of the brain. Thank you.